This is the story of the Canandaigua Chamber of Commerce, 100 years old and growing. It's the evolution of a business organization that has endured for a century and continues into a new 21st century. A time that's taken its members from the days of horse and carriage to the internet and cyberspace. But this is much more than an economic story. It's the story of a gifted community in an extraordinary place. It's the story of families who established businesses, who built and continue to build a thriving commercial region of sons who went off to war and came back home to build their families' dreams, of leaders and innovators, people who bring their energy, skills, and vision to the table to create Canandaigua's unique character and quality of life. It's the story of Canandaigua's people, past, present, and future. The early 1900s, the United States was the Wild West in business. People were becoming millionaires in industry. Model T Fords chugged down dirt roads. The Titanic shocked the world by sinking in the North Atlantic. And there was no income tax. Meanwhile, in 1910, New York financier Frederick Ferris Thompson and his wife Mary were settling in at Sonnenberg, their new summer house in Canandaigua. As the county seat and a center of law, Canandaigua was a prosperous mecca of commerce, an elegant small city at the head of a deep, pure glacial lake in western New York State. It boasted every possible service and needed goods of the time. Railways brought people into the city for the atmosphere and infrastructure. As the uh, community started to evolve, uh, in the early 1900s, you know, we had uh, Pen Pennsylvania Railroad and the New York Central Railroad both came through Canandaigua. We had five hotels. We had a booming downtown business. We had 54 fraternal organizations in town. You know, Canandaigua people had a tendency uh, to gang, go group together to do things. By then, Canandaigua businessmen had been meeting on a regular basis. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce were a product of uh, business organizations, but their history goes back a bit further than that uh, to uh, what were called boards of trade. Well organized and active, Canandaigua's Board of Trade published a book in 1907 extolling Canandaigua's advantages and growth. In January 1910, they met for the first time as a Chamber of Commerce. The Canandaigua Chamber of Commerce was formed to promote the benefits and to propagandize industry into understanding what Canandaigua had to offer, and they had to offer a lot. Among the original 1910 chamber board members were two men who would go on to produce four generations to run their family businesses and serve on their chamber boards, the Kennedys and the Hamlins. In 1891, my great-grandfather Grant M. Kennedy started the funeral home and furniture business in Canandaigua. He was also one of the founding members of the Canandaigua Chamber of Commerce. And that's the beautiful thing about uh, this, uh, the chamber uh, being 100 years old, because we should pause and celebrate in the context of the long term and the long term values of Canandaigua and the chamber and you find uh, individuals and uh, businesses that are uh, equally uh, long in perspective. So uh, to celebrate uh, long term and the values of long term um, is important because uh, things that are enduring are valuable. During World War I, we were a major uh, location where troops would, uh, you know, soldiers would get on the train to head to war. 
and uh, over on uh, Ontario Street you would see a uh, just massive gatherings of people as the soldiers would get on the train, kiss their loved ones goodbye, and uh, head off to uh, uh, God knows where. What a marvelous age we live in. Heartbeat, heartbeat, fire in the middle. Heartbeat, heartbeat. The Roaring Twenties brought jazz, talking movies, and something else to Canandaigua, the sound of automobile engines. In 1924, you could buy a Chevrolet Roadster for around $500. Women had the vote, and many had jobs outside the home. The chamber had an office on the second floor of the Bemis block, no bigger than an average-sized master bedroom of today. But they had a tiny staff and a small budget. It was a tight-knit group of businessmen, and in the coming depression, they helped keep Canandaigua stable. One of the big items that happened in, in the late 1920s was the VA hospital, and the Canandaigua Chamber of Commerce played a major role in bringing that uh, facility to uh, Canandaigua. And if what, the Canandaigua Chamber of Commerce put together the necessary documentation and political efforts necessary to make the, the VA hospital come here. The day the VA hospital uh, was announced, the, everything shut down and they had a huge party. VA hospital for years was the major employer in this community and generated a tremendous amount of revenue uh, that was the fuel for uh, future uh, economic growth in this area. Uh, so the Chamber of Commerce was a, uh, a big contributor to bringing the VA uh, to Canandaigua. By the Second World War, two members of the Chamber's founding families and future board members were enjoying a happy childhood. 1945, uh, this was just ending the war, and just prior to that, uh, they used to have school buses that would pull up the Union School, where the YMCA is now, and uh, we would go out in the fields and, and uh, pick potatoes, and, and uh, because all the men were out either at war or at school at that time, there was no farmers available to do this, so they asked for volunteers. You could get on your bicycle and come down to Main Street, and you know, you'd stop in. Um, at Clement's, the restaurant, or you go to Woolworth for a, uh, a hot dog, you know, that they make behind the counter, you know, they squeeze it down in a, uh, in one of those sort of electric skillets, you know. God, it was heaven. It all cost a quarter. I mean, you had your bicycle, you could live off the land. It was wonderful. <laughs> Soldiers returned, families were reunited, and businesses grew along with the population. At mid-century, Canandaigua continued to enjoy an almost idyllic all-American existence. Back in uh, the, between the 40s and the 60s, downtown Canandaigua was really a buyer's, uh, just a wonderful place to come. And on Friday and Saturday nights, it was difficult to get a place to park. Back in those days, when anybody came to Canandaigua, they could park their car and literally never move their car and buy everything that they needed to live on. Canandaigua was open on Friday nights. Um, as a matter of fact, there used to be a police officer in front of what is now Chase Bank, and he crossed people all night long. Um, every business was open downtown on Friday nights. Fifty years past the horse and carriage days, everything was geared toward the automobile. Expansion continued. Canandaigua was being taken into a new age with the chamber at the lead. For years and years and years during the horse-drawn era, Main Street was dirt. In the 1940s, late 1940s, they decided to do a major Main Street reconstruction. Back in 1940, Main Street uh, was a brick street, and it was uh, rough and full of uh, all kinds of holes and potholes. In uh, 1950, Main Street was completed, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce, I believe, was in charge of the gigantic parade that they had on that particular, I think it was on a Saturday, and uh, there was a viewing stand constructed right in front of the courthouse 
And uh, that was probably the largest parade that I can recall ever uh, witnessing uh, because they had uh, fire trucks and fire companies and marching bands from all over the state that came to celebrate the ribbon cutting and the opening of our brand new smooth Main Street. It wasn't just Main Street that was changed forever in Canandaigua. A whole generation came of age in the 60s. A generation that took issues by the horns and wrestled them into shape through activism. That included business. Some chose to become involved in the Chamber of Commerce as members, joining vital committees and the board. In Canandaigua, they found the Chamber played many roles and was woven into the fabric of a strong and stable community. If you've grown up here, uh, if you've participated in Canandaigua uh, over decades, as I now have, you start to understand that the hub of those relationships uh, comes from the, the Chamber of Commerce. It is truly the heartbeat of Canandaigua. And if you think about it, we've had a number of different executive presidents, uh, executive directors, uh, people that really, in a leadership role, of all ages. And I think it demonstrates that although there are changes in faces over time, the heartbeat, you know, the core essence of what makes us great in Canandaigua starts at our chamber. When I first got involved with the chamber, would have been back in the early 70s, they asked me to chair the Canandaigua Cup Race, which was a bike race around the community. And that's how I originally got uh, really involved with the chamber back then. The little chamber office in the Bemis block headed for bigger and better things. A brand new facility in a new location, the A-frame on routes 5 and 20. It was a location that was never without controversy. I remember there, were, there was a lot of discussion about whether this was a good idea to take the chamber off of Main Street, to put it down there. Uh, it was, uh, some people felt, well, it was really sort of a welcoming situation because people coming from the east down 5 and 20 would see it and be able to stop, and they saw it in that light. Whereas others said, well, the chamber should be on Main Street. And uh, so there was a lot of discussion, but they ended up with the uh, A-frame and, um, you know, were there many years. The legendary Marvin Rapp headed the chamber's staff that worked out of the modern building on the outskirts of town. His staff included someone destined to make history in the chamber as its first woman president. As it happened, the chamber was looking for an administrative assistant, um, and I replied to the job. Marv Rapp was the uh, chamber interim, and uh, Marv interviewed me, and um, I was very fortunate that he liked what he heard, and I had some skills that certainly matched what their needs were, and the rest, I guess you could say, is history. The coming decades would be full of issues for the chamber. One of the biggest issues became the location of the chamber itself. We located a, a spot that was not obvious as a good location for the chamber when we first inspected it because it was the uh, fish and bait shop on Main Street, uh, right next to, at the time, what was the Catskill Bagel Shop. When we finally decided to um, look at um, the fish and tackle store, which is now uh, the home of the chamber, that certainly had possibilities, but it had a lot of, of work that needed to be done in order to bring that building up to what it is today. Over the years, the buildings really served the chamber, I think, well. Um, and it's changed the face of the chamber from being uh, something that really was for health insurance and tourists to something that was really a vital part of the community. By the 1980s, women were leading climbing corporate ladders, heading up businesses, and becoming business owners. It was no exception in Canandaigua. The difference was, this is a place where women leaders have always been nurtured, supported, respected, and recognized. The chamber is a place of grateful recognition and celebration of its outstanding members. 
I, I think the history of women in leadership is very rooted, uh, not only in Canandaigua, but the region. Obviously, Susan B. Anthony and our courthouse here in Canandaigua. And um, there has been numerous examples. Uh, the Athena Award, uh, not only the first in the state, but maybe one of the first in the country, continues to recognize the uh, talents and recognize the abilities of women leaders uh, throughout the region. As a woman leader, uh, I have always found that the people in this community embrace female leadership. They look to us as leaders and not necessarily as, as men or women, but the fact that we are equal and able to uh, manage and to lead and to bring um, those skills to, to the workplace. At 100 years old, the Canandaigua Chamber of Commerce heads into new territory of growth. Just as it did at the beginning, it has stepped onto the threshold of new opportunities, new connections, and ever-widening paths. You can't find, really, a, a nicer location in Canandaigua, and the Chamber is part of the leadership of that community. So I would predict uh, I don't think we'll be using precisely this technology, but we'll be making some other kind of uh, chronicle uh, of the Chamber's history 100 years from now. I, I just think the Chamber of Commerce, without the Chamber, the Canandaigua would not be what it is today. It is a team sport. It's not who's the president as much as who's, um, uh, who's dedicated and shows up and adds their energy and ideas and enthusiasm to this uh, common thing that we call Canandaigua. I think whenever an organization reaches a milestone such as this, we also have to give thanks to those people who had the foresight a hundred years ago to think about starting an organization like this. And I'm sure that if they were here today, they'd be very, very pleased with what the chamber has grown to become. I'm not sure what the future of the chamber will hold, uh, but I can tell you thanks to the previous boards, committees, and all its members, and the foundation that they have laid previously, the Canandaigua Chamber will continue to have an impact in the growth and commerce of this community for the next hundred years. In the end, this story is about what we love about this place. Chosen to be our home, our community, our source, and our delight. We are held in its magic. It's why we stay. It's what we come back to. It's what we believe in. It's who we are. May the next hundred years continue this story.